Today we're continuing our sermon series looking at the church vision. And the first two talks about being transformed by Jesus are up on our YouTube channel. Um, so I would encourage you to catch up with those if you missed any. But today we're moving on to look at the next line um, of the vision on the slide there. Raising generation of spirit-filled disciples raising generations of spirit-filled disciples and again we're going to split this into two parts so um, in this first part we'll be focusing on raising generations and then next week Jack's going to speak about spirit-filled disciples I think the first thing I want to point out is that we're talking about raising generations of spirit-filled disciples, not raising the next generation of disciples. And of course, the younger members of our church are really important and we need to invest in them. But I think it would be really easy to hear those words, raising generations, and assume that we're talking about younger people, a bit like the growing younger part of the previous vision. But it's really important to write, notice right from the start that we're talking about generations of disciples. Whatever age we are, younger or older, however long we've been a Christian, many years or a few weeks, we've got a part in this. It's about our growth as disciples of Jesus Christ and the growth of those around us. It's something that we each need to take ownership of. The writer of Hebrews that we just heard from encourages us to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. I love those words, hold unswervingly. It suggests a determination not to be distracted by the things that can make us wander off course. Not to let our circumstances make us lose sight of the hope that we have in Jesus not to become unintentional about our spiritual formation. And that's not something we can easily do alone. Last week, Matt shared a model of intentional spiritual formation. Um, that slide was part of it. It highlighted the role of community for our growth as disciples. And much of what I'm speaking about today will probably come under that community aspect and we're going to move on to look at some of the others as well as the weeks go on. Not exclusively, but a lot of what I'm saying today to come under that community heading. And the verses from Hebrews echo that community idea. Let us not consider how we may spur one another on, not giving up on meeting together, but encouraging one another. Notice it's one another, together, let us. When I heard those words hold unswervingly, what came to mind for me was a rally driver and a co-driver. I don't know if you've ever seen a video of them working together. Um, you might want to argue that they do a lot of swerving, actually, to get round corners. But there's something important about keeping the car on course on a path that's not particularly easy to follow or navigate. And it wouldn't be possible for the driver of that car to do that without the co-driver sat next to them, reminding them of the route, preparing them for obstacles and hazards. If you've ever seen the footage from inside the car, it's quite amazing to watch the way the two of them work together to make it round the course. And maybe you've had the uh, misfortune of having to ask someone for directions when you've been lost. And you've probably had good and bad experiences of that. Sometimes you just know that the person you've asked seems to know exactly what they're talking about. You're really confident that their directions will get you to where you want to go. But other times, it quickly becomes apparent that the person might not actually have a clue what they're talking about. They just don't seem to want to let you down. So they're going to offer you some advice anyway, even if they're not actually sure 
where they're sending you. Thankfully for the rally driver, the co-driver is an expert who studied the route, knows it well, knows you really well and how you drive and what you need to hear at what moment. They're able to provide just the right word at just the right time to usually keep you on course. And of course, it's not just those two people in the car. There's a whole team of people who look after the car and make it ready for each stage of a rally. You don't finish a rally without a team. You don't raise generations of disciples without an intentional disciple-making community. And that's what we want to be, an intentional disciple-making community. Discipleship isn't something that's done to you. No one else can do it for you. We have to want to grow for ourselves. But it's something that happens within a community where we're intentional about becoming more like Jesus. Because of that, it's worth um, considering the two questions that were on the title slide. Who is raising you up? And who are you raising up? If we're going to use the language of Hebrews, we might say, who are you spurring on toward love and good deeds? Who are you encouraging? And who's spurring you on towards love and good deeds? Who's encouraging you? Someone once shared a way of thinking about this with me. Um, and I think there is a picture just to make it a little bit easier but it's a bit like a compass where you've got a north, south, east and west and if you imagine that you're in the middle then we think about the people around us who are influencing our life as a disciple of Jesus the person in the position at the top in the north position is the person who's raising you up the person who's kind of ahead of you in the way of Jesus a bit like that co-driver someone who can speak the right word at the right time to help you go the right way people use different names for that kind of person and you might think of that as a mentor or a spiritual director or a soul friend but it's usually someone who you've, you've chosen and asked to fill that role at least for a part of your life in the Christian tradition, people have often sought advice from people like this. It was quite normal to seek counsel from someone who seemed wise spiritually, who was ahead of you in the journey. That's why there were people going out into the desert to meet the desert fathers and ask for advice. It's why people have often visited monastic communities, monks and nuns, and, and recognised those people as spiritual people committed to growing in their faith. We might just be able to accompany us on the journey. Perhaps nowadays it's less common to have this sort of person as we've become a bit more individualistic. Maybe we don't feel like we need that sort of help. But it seems so important in the Christian tradition and it's really important for our discipleship. When I was talking about this at home, um, Gemma's sister is staying and she suggested that possibly the most high profile example of this and not faith related but a similar sort of idea is the audiences that the late Queen used to have um, with Prime Ministers and the King has them now every week the Prime Minister would go and visit the Queen so many of those former Prime Ministers when they're interviewed speak about how they valued that time with Queen Elizabeth Someone who'd heard things before, who'd seen how the world works, who'd helped other people along their journey, was able to provide words of wisdom at just the right time. And she could advise, encourage, but also challenge. Of course, she also had people in her north position. 
The Queen had chaplains who looked out for her spiritual welfare, who she would meet with regularly to figure out how to be a good queen, faithfully following Jesus Christ. And that faith came through um, in many of her talks and speeches. I wonder how many of us today can honestly say we've got someone in that north position. And if we think we do, do they know that they're there? Um, Is it an intentional relationship that we've sought out? The temptation for me when I was um, not quite um, up to speed with how this works was just to write the vicar's name there or my life group leader or something like that. But I never actually sat down with them one-to-one and had some input from them. So I wonder whether you have someone in that slot. If not, that's okay. It's probably best just to be honest and to name that. But I wonder if there's someone you trust who you could ask to take that role. Something to pray about, something to think about. Who might that person be? And perhaps be bold and brave and ask them. The person in the south position is the person that you're raising up. Someone you're investing in. in. Perhaps they've asked you temptation as a parent is to write your child there which is absolutely good and proper but perhaps there might be someone else who you want to invest in too but not everyone will have someone there either Um, because so many people haven't asked someone to be their north you don't always have someone to be your south it's a two-way relationship and both of you can grow as you are someone else's north You will learn more about yourself as you guide them. North and south. The person who's above you is also growing in discipleship. The person who's below you, you'll learn from too. It's not a one-way thing. I should have had arrows at both ends of each bit, sorry. It's about recognising where we are and taking ownership of our discipleship. The east and west positions are the people who are kind of around us on our level, who we're doing life with. And that could be members of a life group or people you pray with regularly, people you do life with who encourage you in the faith. Most of us might find it easier to write names into those positions. We're called to be the kind of community that is intentional about making disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. That's clearly a call to evangelism, but it's also a call to raising generations of spirit-filled disciples. Raising people who are training in the way of Jesus. Baptise and teach them everything I've commanded you. Jesus said. I'm sure that happens when we gather on Sundays, but real growth doesn't just rely on a sermon and um, a time of worship on a Sunday. It goes deeper than that. It's really important that we pay attention to the community that we're being formed in. Particularly, I would suggest, whether we have people in those north and south positions of this Um, kind of diagram so as I finish just some questions to consider who is guiding and directing you as you follow the way of Jesus who are you learning from who's raising you up and who are you guiding and directing Who's learning from you? Who are you raising up?